Talk about movies with you Talk about movies with you We'll learn about behind the scenes and deeper meanings Cause this is just a film review Hi, so Jonah Hex uh, It's hard to really categorize this movie because it is based on a comic book uh, it's also hard to categorize it because it's not the typical superhero movie. Um, there's talk of making a Dead Man movie, and anyone who's familiar with the character Dead Man, uh, he's a man who was murdered, and uh, he has to try and solve his own murder, but he also has other missions that he has to go on. And Dead Man has been featured heavily in uh, episodes of Batman's uh, more recent television series, The Brave and the Bold, which kind of um, gives Batman a more retro look, but also pairs him up with a lot of um, other uh, heroes in the DC universe. And this is where I actually have to give Warner Brothers a lot of praise for uh, the way that they produce the Warner, uh, the DC uh, films, as opposed to Marvel films, uh, which is now, I guess, a subsidiary of Disney films, uh, of uh, the Walt Disney Corporation, uh, because... Uh, Disney bought Marvel. Anyway, um, that's one of the reasons why you've seen such a rise in um, the number of Marvel films put out, whereas before um, they were put out by 20th Century Fox, or um, largely 20th Century Fox was uh, the producer of uh, the various Marvel films for a good while. But I guess as soon as Disney bought the company, uh, they got rights to the characters and decided to put it out. Anyway, DC, uh, when it's put out by Warner Brothers, um, has been just an excellent uh, production value. Uh, prior to uh, prior to Warner Brothers buying the, the rights to DC Comics and buying DC Comics, uh, you had films like, uh, let's say, the Superman franchise. Uh, which got uh, bought the rights for by uh, Alexander and Ilya Salkind, and they produced a number of uh, well, they produced Superman one and two, as well as three and four, and then the ill-fated, short-lived uh, television syndicated series Superboy. Um, I'll get back to Jonah Hex in a minute. Um, I have to say that. Um, that the first two Supermans were great, but the Richard Donner recut of Superman is really excellent. And fortunately, Warner Brothers owns the rights to uh, the the all the Superman films as well. So there's no worrying about um, you know copyright over that. I'm sure there was a lot of uh, fighting over that. Um, but Warner Brothers eventually got the rights when they wanted to release, uh, say, uh, the. Superman films recently all in one uh, box set in a uh, steel case actually and uh, it contains um, it contains different cuts of uh, the original Superman first two Superman films um, and uh, I remember I I got a copy somewhere of the Richard Donner recut of Superman 2. I forget where I found it. Um, but uh, I know that I already did a review on it. Anyway, point being that it was just an excellent, excellent film. Com and not a whole lot of differences. Um, but Richard Donner's story, the original story that they came up with, was so good. And uh, when I heard the Salkind introduction and commentary on uh, on uh, Superman 3, I just heard it, and he was just talking about it as if it was just about getting the film done and over with and getting it out there. It's like, here you go, kids, a Superman movie. You know, it's like if you slam a sandwich together and don't care really what goes in, you're just picking stuff that sounds good you might end up with a sandwich that and, and you don't care about the proportions of 
what you're putting in or anything like that. Uh, it it can sometimes um, you know really uh, make for an unappealing concoction. And uh, unfortunately, in the case of Superman 3, which was entirely of the Salkinds making, they um, they kind of just put it together, and it wasn't very good, and there was way too much Richard Pryor. As much as I love Richard Pryor, you know, Richard Pryor is a great comedian. I've loved every single one of his movies that I've seen, and I've seen just about every Richard Pryor movie that I can think of that's out there. Including, uh, except for I think uh, one or two that he did, Gene, that he did with Gene Wilder, uh, but I've seen just about every single one that he has done. Um, and uh, yes, I know I'm really off topic, but point being that um, that the Salkinds really messed it up, and as soon as Warner Brothers got in there, they really uh, tried to make it an excellent film. And uh, I really have to endorse Warner Brothers as a good company uh, for if you're looking for entertainment. Uh, they're about the only studio that I actually will endorse. I don't care if they're a Time Warner company, which makes them, you know, as bad as Viacom or uh, or Walt Disney Corporation. Uh, yes, they're all evil, uh, but Warner Brothers functions independently enough of the rest of Ted Turner's uh, enterprise uh, that they're able to put out uh, films and uh, television shows that you know are just a little bit of a cut above the rest of the homogeny and I really have to say that um, if you want examples go to the Warner Brothers website um, and take a look at some of the online television shows that they have. I will warn you that um, they haven't quite gotten with the whole program of turning the volume down on advertisements um, so that you you don't have your ears blasted off. Uh, the advertisements are still really really loud unlike on just about every other online site where you can watch videos. Uh, YouTube, Hulu, Crackle, you know, although Crackle, it's still pretty loud, uh, but nowhere near as loud as Warner Brothers. Um, uh, anyway, you take a look at what they have. They have some episodes of Batman the Animated Series. They have some episodes of Babylon 5. Um, they have uh, some of their older uh, programs, uh, but of course those are the two shows that I have gone there to watch in the recent past. Um, Unfortunately, they don't put out enough of their content to watch, or they would easily be one of the top sites to go to. And um, unfortunately, they haven't made a deal with Hulu to uh, watch anything uh, so that you can watch their stuff online. Comedy Central has done it. Uh, NBC Universal has a lot of their shows on it. Um, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but it's just part of the game, I guess. Uh, aside from that. Uh, getting back to Jonah Hex, they went all out with the casting. The casting is simply phenomenal. Uh, a Megan Fox plays uh, Jonah Hex's uh, love interest, uh, and uh, John Malkovich plays the villain, which is like perfect casting. John Malkovich is a villain? All right. You know, ever since In the Line of Fire or uh, Con Air. He's just been excellent as a villain because he's a he's a wonderful actor. He plays it very um, um, I don't want to say cerebral, more pathological. <clears throat> you know, you get the emotionality and the intensity of the characters. Um, so anyway, Jonah Hex is different from other comic book characters because. He doesn't so much have superpowers as he does in in the traditional sense, as they're more supernatural powers, and uh, that comes from when he uh, died and was resurrected by Native American uh, Native American shamans. Um, and there you have to kind of suspend your disbelief, 
and just kind of take it as a plot device that um, you know that that they would know these magic spells and herbs and potions to resurrect a man uh, to where he is half alive and half dead. Um, another thing about him is that he's not a very good looking guy because he is mutilated physically. So he's totally different from uh, other uh, other uh, characters in the DC universe. Um, if anything, if you look at um, an episode of Justice League called the Once in Future Thing, uh, I, yeah, I believe it's the Once in Future Thing, um, Batman, Wonder Woman, uh, and Green Lantern go after uh, a villain called Kronos who's stealing stuff from history and they run into Jonah Hex and he looks a bit like Two-Face uh, in the uh, version that they have for that uh, but Jonah Hex is different because it takes place in the Old West it's uh, it, but don't be fooled by that into thinking it's something like a True Grit or Open Range which stars uh, Robert Duvall and Kevin Costner, or even like Silverado, because um, Jonah Hex is a bit more like the character of Snake Plis Pliskin, played by um, Kurt Russell in the Escape from New York and Escape from L.A. series. Um, he is total badass, and he... Uh, he doesn't really conform to society. Uh, I love his line when someone asks him about whether or not he really supported the South. Uh, he says uh, that, you know, both sides were really just a bunch of hypocrites. And uh, that's relatively true. I'm a, I'm a pro-North, pro-Union guy, as most people are, but I, I still believe that to a certain degree, there there was hypocrisy on all sides, um, but at the same time, I do believe that that slavery was uh, simply the spark that ignited uh, the powder keg. Uh, there were already deep cultural divides between the North and the South, and um, really, slavery was just an inflammatory issue, and uh, it took Kansas. Uh, as I recall, to screw it up uh, because it was north of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, anyway, so that's just kind of a bizarre little fun fact about Civil War history in case you didn't know. American Civil War history. British Civil War history will get into a whole other topic, especially if I ever get around to doing a review of Cromwell, uh, which is an excellent movie. I'll probably do one for that later. Anyway, Point being, uh, Jonah Hex is uh, very dark, um, and he is not completely a hero. You know, he is full of vengeance and fury and hatred. Um, at one point, he kills a bad guy who uh, who helped, uh, as I remember, I helped murder his family. Uh, he kills the bad guy, and he has a power where if he touches a uh, a person who's dead, they can they come back to life as long as he's touching them. But um, it can only be for so long, and the sooner that the body has died, the more it starts to um, burn, and you'll you'll see little effects where it starts to smolder. And what, they introduced it in a very wonderful way. They they had a deleted scene uh, where he where Jonah Hex meets a very uh, refined, fancy uh, Union officer uh, who, well, I should say U.S. officer because by this time the Civil War is over, and it takes place around the uh, anniversary of uh, the nation's founding. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so if the body died like a couple of hours ago or a day or two ago and he touches it then it'll be like a 
few minutes before it starts to smolder. If the body just died, it'll start to smolder right away. If the body's been dead for, uh, you know, a year or two, then it'll uh, only start to smolder a little bit uh, after like a good while has passed, like maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes or so. I wasn't exactly keeping track of the time while I was watching the scene because it's a very intense scene whenever he brings someone back to life. But the point is, he kills a, a guy who, who I guess murdered his, helped murder his family, uh, which is why he has so much vengeance in him. Uh, and um, he, it turns out that he married uh, a Native American woman from this local tribe, and that's why they resurrected him, was because, as far as they were concerned, he was one of them. So then he grabs the guy, and the guy comes back to life and immediately starts to smolder. And he holds him there and holds him there, and he's just burning up. And then he punches him, and the guy disintegrates into ash so that he can never be brought back from the dead. The body just is disintegrated. Uh, so there is no bringing him back, and that's just like, oh, dude, so dark and brutal. But you gotta love it. And all throughout, uh, speaking of dark and brutal, they're just playing this heavy metal western themed music that's just really cool to listen to. So it's a great experience, a lot of fun. Um, of course, Megan Fox is really hot and everything. Um, although they put her in a corset with like, um, I believe it's the Wasp uh, kind of corset or an hourglass corset. It really cinches in to a little um, point so that, um, you know, her waist is is really thin in that thing. And, you know, she's already a very skinny girl. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's fine somehow, but I just, uh, I saw that and I was a little bit creeped out because it narrowed her waist down to, I want to say, maybe about eight inches across from the look of it. It just looked really creepy, and for all I know, they might have, uh, they might have only had her in a regular corset, and then used computer effects to kind of narrow it in a little bit more. There's no telling, um, because they already used so many computers in the film already that I wouldn't put it past them if they just wanted to give it a more authentic uh, 19th century look. Um, but you'll recognize so many faces, and there will also be some faces that you won't recognize because of the way they have them make up, made up. Kind of like in True Grit, where they had the guy um, from the Bill and Ted movies, I forget his name, but he played he played Bill Preston in the film. Um, you know, opposite Keanu, the one you haven't really heard of too much, but he plays the bad guy in that, and he's actually uh, uh, pretty good as uh, the bad guy in True Grit. I've already done a review for that, so I won't go back over it. But as it is, um, Jonah Hex is easily one of the best action movies I've seen uh, in the last year or two. Um, uh, also, actually I should do a couple other reviews as long as I have your attention. Um, I will say I haven't seen the movie version of The Little Engine that could, but I don't approve of adapting a film version of the little engine that could I wouldn't even approve of a cartoon of it because the book is too good its beauty is in its simplicity and its shortness you can read it over and over again you don't need celebrity voices Whoopi Goldberg does the voice of a water tower in it so they make it a bit like cars and uh, the little engine has like a older train that's like its father or grandfather and kind of its mentor and it's just no it's too much you don't need a reason for the train to to for the little engine to be taking the toys somewhere you don't need it to have a conductor uh, with a name and a backstory or anything it's just a little train taking toys to town and it doesn't believe that it can get over the hill unless it thinks it can you know until it starts believing in itself 
that is enough. You don't need uh, you don't need a whole story centered around it. This is the same problem that you saw when Jim Carrey and Ron Howard and all of them got together and made How the Grinch Stole Christmas, or they simply shortened it to The Grinch. And I can't stand that they made it all about just The Grinch and not about Christmas. They tried to water down what Christmas was about and make it totally non-religious. I'm okay with that because in the story they make it non-religious. Uh, but at the same time, I really have to say, you know, that the whole movie just was overblown. It was over the top. Everyone was wearing all this makeup. They made everything look way too... Um, they, they tried to make it look way too much like Dr. Seuss's style of drawing. And, uh, and when you do that, it just makes everything look freaky. Just look at Mike Myers as the cat in the hat. And I don't need to say any more. The best thing that they did with Dr. Seuss's characters was when they decided to make an animated series on PBS starring Martin Short as the voice of the Cat in the Hat called The Cat in the Hat Knows a Lot About That. Where it actually teaches you a little bit about nature, a little bit about, um, you know, the world. I watched that show this last year because it would be on. Uh, just during the daytime in the morning or in the evening and I would enjoy it uh, and it was kind of cute and funny didn't have to think that much it was not easy to fall asleep to or wake up to or something and um, it was kind of cool because they have songs and so it's fun um, but they keep the animation style like that of the Dr. Seuss books they don't try and have a live action version of the Dr. Seuss style, which just ends up covering people in makeup and putting them in, in stupid looking wigs and outfits. They made um, Cindy Lou Who in the film, like about 10 in the film, and uh, in the original story she was only two. She was no more than two. That was the whole point of Cindy Lou Who's character was she was completely little and naive. She wasn't trying to make the, uh, you know, bring out the niceness in the Grinch or anything. And, you know, they shoved way too many celebrities in there, and Jim Carrey was, was way too much Jim Carrey and not just the character. It was no fun to watch. And I remember, because I worked in the theater, uh, when it came out, and I watched it a couple times, parts of it anyway. I didn't actually sit down and watch, maybe I did on a break or something, I forget. Point being, it just wasn't a very good movie. Um, so yeah, Little Engine That Could, I'm not going to really recommend it. Just read the book. The book isn't that long. I think it's like, what, 10 pages at most? And your kid will love it. They'll be able to read along learn to read. I mean, that's the whole point of the book, right? Is It's a children's book teaching them how to read. Making it into a computer graphics movie? What's the point? Why would? Why does it even need to be CGI? <coughs> Excuse me. Why does The Little Engine That Could need to be a CGI movie? Why does it need to be a feature-length film or even a half-hour-long film? Why does it need to be a film at all? It's because they are relying on brand name recognition for a short children's story. Um, a while back, they produced um, they produced Dougal, which uh, was which is a British story, I believe. Um, involving magic and a little dog uh, who leads his friends on an adventure to um, to uh, you know stop an evil wizard great little story uh, the film version that they made uh, featured Whoopi Goldberg, William H. Macy, and Greg Proops 
among others. And it was sensational. That one was CGI. That one I could deal with being CGI because it, the way that they rendered the characters was beautifully done. Uh, that being said, uh, they also could have done it in regular animation style because one of the nice things about computers is that you can do 2D animation uh, very easily. Uh, that's actually how they're doing the Cat in the Hat series that I mentioned earlier. Is they're using uh, Flash, and the only reason I can tell that is because I've looked at a lot of Flash animation, and it has become a more prevalent means of producing shows quickly and inexpensively, because once you have the character designs done, uh, you don't really need as large a team of animators as you would for a 3D one or for a hand-drawn 2D one. You can uh, just move a few things around and uh, and uh, before you know it, you have uh, a 2D animated short or film that does very well. Uh, and anyway, that's and, and that's a way that um, that uh, that PBS and its various uh, production companies have found to produce uh, things at a low cost with a low overhead and a small production team. Uh, Originally, the Venture Brothers was going to be animated using Flash, uh, but they found that it was just cheaper and quicker to uh, send the animation overseas to do. Uh, you know, have a, a team in Korea uh, do it, as I recall. They use Korean animators. Uh, all that being said, um, moving moving on from that, because I've dwelt on that long enough, um, I saw a, uh, another film recently called uh, The Chosen One, starring uh, Rod Schneider, and uh, it's kind of in the vein of his uh, Happy Madison films that he did, um, which South Park made fun of, where he's like a stapler, um, uh, and just all these other things. Uh, you know, he... he Only this one is much more of a real story. Uh, and I have to say it's a great departure from the usual stuff. Uh, like The Animal, which I actually thought was okay. Um, or... What was it? Uh, the Hot Chick. He was in that. Um, I did see Deuce Bigelow European Gigolo and Deuce Bigelow Male Gigolo and I like Deuce Bigelow Male Gigolo a lot better I, I realized that the second one was just kind of uh, to capitalize on the popularity of the first one but unfortunately they just ended up kind of stretching the premise way too far and and uh, taking it way over the top you know making gigoloing an institution with awards and uh, uh, a an international society of man whores or something. It's just too much uh, once you get to that point. Um, but, you know, they brought back some uh, some of the characters. They introduced some new ones, some really bad dates that uh, Deuce was able to go on and everything. So it was fun. It, it, it wasn't bad to watch, but I liked the first one better. Uh, that being said... Um, in the chosen one, <clears throat> he's a uh, he's a car salesman for Nissan. You know they're not afraid to to actually have uh, brand names in the films. So and uh, he's drinking like Heinekens right and left. So you know just product promotion all over the place. <sighs> I wonder if I'll get a royalty check for like five cents from from uh, Nissan and Heineken now. Because Nissan is is uh, the production company of the Nissan Leaf, the electric car of the future. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, anyway, so I won't endorse Heineken because I don't particularly care for it, but a lot of people I know really like Heineken. So, whatever, drink it if you want. It'll get you drunk. Um, if you're of age and drink responsibly. Anyway. 
um, point being, uh, he's a car salesman, and he uh, some some uh, Colombian shamans and a beautiful woman uh, from their tribe, who I guess they bring along because she speaks English, go looking for the chosen one to uh, to lead them and uh, do some kind of good in the world to bring balance back to the world that will then put snow on their mountain because they're worried about uh, you know if there's no snow on the mountain it means something in the world is wrong and it needs to be set back in balance um, so there has to be someone out there doing good and um, so uh, Rob Schneider is the chosen one and uh, he doesn't really get into so many wacky situations as he just kind of goes on a personal journey. And Steve Buscemi stars as his uh, brother. And uh, and uh, the mom from Two and a Half Men, I forget her name off the top of my head, but she um, she also stars in it as uh, Rob Schneider and Steve Buscemi's mom. And she does a great job, actually. Uh, the cast actually does a really good job in the film. And Rob Schneider has to kind of choose between... Uh, the life he's led for a while and uh, hasn't been happy with and you know he recent he's depressed because he recently uh, his his wife left him for a yoga instructor um, and partway through the film uh, she invites him out to lunch and uh, says you know oh well I'd like to get back together with you because you know it it didn't mean anything, and and uh, Rob Schneider actually makes the smart, the smarter decision uh, at first by simply saying, you know, no thanks. Because once a person cheats and leaves you, and you take them back, they're just gonna see that you're a doormat and and just a a quick easy solution for while they're temporarily without a more exciting lover. Uh, you know, and apparently this couple was married for three or four years and probably were dating a long time before that. So I have to really, you know, say go Rob. Unfortunately, he slips a little bit uh, because he wants to um, he wants to really sell the uh, the president of Nissan or something for Nissan. American distribution or something like that. He wants to sell the guy on the dealership and encourage them to uh, continue to do business in the U.S. or something. And apparently, he was able to really impress the guy before by doing like an Elvis impersonation at um, at a, a karaoke bar, and it just was a lot of fun for the guy. So they're kind of trying to dust off that old trick because they know it works. And I have to say that um, Rob Schneider does do an excellent Elvis impersonation. He's, been, he's done it for decades now, and he's always done a really good job. Uh, he's actually in good form in this film, uh, just as an actor. He kind of plays it the same as he plays all his characters, um, but he does a good job. He's, he's not so much funny out loud as the way he reacts to some of the situations, which is typical for the Rob Schneider comedy uh, that that he does, but it's 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 more it's more character driven comedy. It's more um, it's it's not even so much a comedy as kind of just a funny story, an amusing story that kind of centers around this character. So I have to say that. Uh, that this is a really different kind of part for him. It goes a little bit dark. Uh, the reason why you only hear me talking about Rob Schneider's brother character and mother character is because he he came home. The br Rob Schneider's brother character, Rob Schneider's character, came home to find his father in his garage, hanging from a noose having killed himself. And so the film takes a dark, dark turn. And it's heartbreaking to uh, to think about that. 
kind of uh, kind of image. So, you know, I have to I have to say that that it's a totally different direction for Rob Schneider and uh, company to take uh, as a comedy goes, but it's a good film. It's not a great film, but it's worth a watch, and uh, and it's amusing. So that's the chosen one, and it's available right now on Hulu. It came out in 2011. I was skeptical because a movie that comes out in 2011 and is already available on Hulu probably isn't that good. After all, uh, what was it? Um, Cuba Gang Jr. and uh, Val Kilmer in Hardwired came out, I think, in it, not that long ago. I think in 2008 or 2010 or something. You can watch my review for it. Um, anyway, that one came out not that long ago, and uh, that one was on uh, Crackle, and it was just absolutely horrible. I couldn't believe how bad it was. So anyway, yeah, the chosen one, do see the little engine that could. Uh, I don't recommend. Um, Jonah Hex, I do recommend. The Grin Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas live version don't recommend animated version do recommend how can you go wrong with the animated version that they did it was brilliantly done it was narrated by Boris Karloff and had the the singer uh, the the singer uh, for the Grinch song was um, the voice of Tony the Tiger that late actor so I mean hey all right anyway uh, so that's it for this probably very long episode of Film Recommendations. Bye-bye.